Haley Patterson. <laughs> and my question is, knowing all that you know now, if you could go back, would you do it all over again? Would I do what all over again? Uh, make comics. No, I think I would have wanted to be a movie star. <laughs> I mean, Brad Pitt needs some competition. <laughs> and it's easier than writing stories. Somebody gives you what you have to say, and everybody fusses over you. Make sure his hair is okay. Are you comfortable, Mr. Pitt? Is that chair good for you? Are you ready to go on? I'm getting so jealous of Brad Pitt. He better not show up here. <laughs> Over here. Uh, hello, Mr. Lee. Outside of the world of comics, uh, what literacy w or literary works impacted you or influenced your work? What literary, work, what literary works have impacted you and influenced you? Um, oh, gosh, everything I've ever read. And I was a big reader when I was young. I read um, Victor Hugo. I read um, Mark Twain. I read Shakespeare. I didn't understand it much, but I love the words. I love that what ho Horatio stuff. And um, the guy who wrote the Edgar Allan Poe, he was my favorite. And I loved everybody. I read everything I'd get my hands on. So they all influenced me. And then, of course, when I started writing comics, I read my own comics, and wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Lee, I was wondering. I was wondering to what degree you think comic book writing today it ha is done with movies in mind, with all the success of Marvel's films, and what your feelings are on that matter. The worst thing about my birthday, about being this age, I can only hear about half of what people say. So forgive me, but would you just let me know what that was? What impact do you think today modern comics is having on the movies that are being made? Well, the modern comics on today's Marvel movies, they're having every impact in the world. They're basing the movies on the comics. And what's happening is the other movie studios are seeing how successful the Marvel comics are. So they're trying to dream up things like this. So again, we've got competition. But we're at the forefront, and don't you forget it. Speak into it. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have a million questions for you, but I'm just going to ask one. I'm Thank sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that the question is not for you, but for my girlfriend right here in the first row. The question have... isn't for me. I'm sorry. I'll go eat some cake in the meantime. Right here in my hand, I have Amazing Spider Man Annual number 21, the wedding of uh, Spider Man or Peter Parker and Mary Jane. And right now, I believe the girl right here in the first row is my Mary Jane. And so nothing would make me happier than to ask for her hand right in front of you, Stanley. He's proposing right now. This girl, this fiance. You better say yes. Andrea, these have been the best five years of my life. I know we're young, but if, I don't care if we wait. Uh, a year or five years, ten years, as long as you say yes right here in front of Stan Lee. Yes? Wow. Did I inspire all of this? I got to tell you something funny. This is the third time this has happened to me. I mean, it's happening to them, too. It's not exactly happening to me, but you know what I mean. I love you so much. I love you, too, Sam. <laughs> this is just great. All right, you may kiss the bride. I'll see you later today. Wow. Now I'll tell you something funny. When I moved out to Los Angeles about 30 years ago, somebody sent me an ad. There's a, a church called the Universal Life Church. And they said, would you like to be a minister? Send $25.
I figured I have nothing to lose. I got this kit with all sorts of things, and it says I'm allowed to perform marriages. So if you'd like me to marry you right now, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> but I, I would still go to a justice of the peace or somebody. Anyway, lots of luck and all the best. I don't know how you're going to top that one, <laughs> but go ahead. Okay. As a writer, would you say it is better to have a single character who is your specialty, a single world, or to work with a multiverse with a bunch of characters and possibilities? Single character should, a, or a should a writer focus on just a character or a multiverse, a bunch of characters? Actually, the writer, if you're talking as a writer who wants to know what should I focus on, <clears throat> I think a writer should focus on what he or she wants to write. If you try to satisfy other people or you try to satisfy the market, you're not giving it your own genuine feeling. If you want to write about one character, write about one character. If you prefer to write about a few, write about a few. The important thing is that what you write be good and interesting and people will want to read it. Don't worry about what do they want or what should I do. Just do what you feel you can do best. How's that? I, I, at Ten seconds and I wasn't even funny. I liked it. Thank you very much. I bored myself sick, I got to tell you. <laughs> she was inspired. Well, I am. I'm somewhat inspiring. I'm, I'm aware. I sometimes wish I were someone else so that I could be listening to me. Oh, well. Yes, ma'am, with the pink hair. What inspired you to become a comic artist? What inspired you to become a comic book artist? Greed. Oh, by the way, I'm not an... <laughs> I'm not an artist. I'm, I, I, actually, I am an artist, but I didn't draw the comics. I was only the writer. I was the guy that nobody paid any attention to. Was all, Boy, isn't Kirby's artwork great? Boy, look the way you Sema drew that. Nobody ever said, Boy, look at that great word that Stanley used. What inspired you to become a comic book writer? Oh, greed. I wanted to make a living, and um, somebody offered me a job, so I took it. If they had offered me a different job, I'd probably be a plumber now. I just took the first job that was offered, and that was it. Yes, sir. Hi, Stan. Uh, just wanted to know uh, your characters. A lot of your big ones are around 50 years old. What has it been like watching those characters evolve for the past 50 years? I miss some of that. A lot of your characters are at least 50 years old, and how was it to watch them evolve through the 50 years? It was fun. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think of them as that old. You know, to me, Peter Parker is still a young guy, and um, Iron Man, Tony Stark, of course, that's really me in disguise. <laughs> We, we had to find an actor who could be close enough to me, so we finally did. Yes, ma'am. I don't think I really answered that, but I didn't know the answer, so I tried to hedge it. Hello, Stan. Um, you're one of my biggest heroes. Um, I have a question. So I know you have many cameos. Like, so... Okay, sorry, I'm starting to act right now. Um, I have many what? Cameos, cameos in your in Marvel movies. What was it like seeing your face on the big screen? Oh, I can't see enough of it, and I'm sorry I'm missing it over there. <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. I get a kick out of it, and it wasn't my idea. They did a an X Men years ago. And the director, Brian Singer, he said, hey, Stan, would you stand in the background and be selling hot dogs or something in, uh, on the beach? I figured, why not? It paid about $12. <clears throat> and then the next guy who did a movie said, well, if Brian Singer used them, I'll use them because I came cheap, I guess. So the next thing I knew, I was doing cameos. And I loved it. I'll tell you a funny story about cameos. Not about cameos so much as wardrobe. And you're wondering, what the hell is he going to say about wardrobe? 
I, when you go to do the cameo, they send you to get your hair done. <laughs> then they send you to wardrobe, and they put on whatever you're supposed to wear. So one day I go for some cameo or other, I don't remember which, and I'm wearing a white shirt, jeans, and a pair of sneakers. So I walk into wardrobe, and the girl there says, Okay, Mr. Lee, here is your white shirt, your jeans, and the sneakers for you to put on. So I said, That's what I'm wearing now. She said, No, but you got to wear ours. So I had to take off mine and put on the exact same thing because it was theirs. See, and you want to be an actor. Forget it. It's stupid. <laughs> I don't understand how you know where the voice comes from. When somebody talks, you look over there, you look over there. To me, it sounds like it's just coming from the air. How can you tell? Good eyes. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. This kind of goes with the last question. What was it like being on the Big Bang Theory? What was it like being on the Big Bang Theory? I loved it! My role wasn't big enough, though. All those other actors kept cutting in. It should have been all me. But, uh, no, it was a lot of fun. It's a great show, and luckily for me, they keep repeating it and repeating it, so I keep seeing myself and seeing myself. I love this guy. I'm lovable. I wish I were someone else. I could sit and drink in all this enjoyment. Yes. Um, hi, Stan. Um, X-Men, for me, really changed my life because I've gone through a lot of stereotypes and, like, getting over adversity. And I just wanted to know, like, did you think that your comics and your stories would have such an impact on people? So the X-Men had such a prolific effect on bringing attention to diversity and ethnicity and, and gender relations. Did you think it would have that big of an impact? <clears throat> It was something that I wanted to make the theme of the X-Men, but I thought I was just doing it to get it out of my system. No, I had no idea that people would notice it and relate to it and talk about it. I'm really thrilled about that. I, it's very gratifying. But the whole purpose was to show that there's nothing wrong with diversity and we should stop hating people who are different than we are. And it came across... <laughs> It's okay if you hate people who hear better than you do, like him. <laughs> That's a good question. How about the answer? <laughs> Boy, you know, he just ignores me. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, Stan. Thank you for saving comics, by the way. Uh, my question is, when Marvel did the Civil War... Uh, who do you who would you side? Tony Stark or Captain America? Well, I like Captain America's shield, but Tony Stark looks more like me. Um, I didn't really take sides. I I thought that both sides had a lot on a lot to say and there's a lot of justification there. And basically, mainly I wasn't reading the books at that time, so I heard about the secret wars from other people. And um Whose side should I say? Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Spider-Man, Peter Parker. I thought he was on. Was he in it? Was he in it? He was. Okay, I was on Spider-Man's side. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really didn't read the this, this series as they came out because I was busy doing cameos, which, as you know, are far more important. Thank you. You're welcome. No, as a fact, you know, today I really don't have time to read the books because I, I am doing a lot of other things. And somebody told me the other day something that Dr. Octopus is in Spider-Man's body or Spider-Man is in Dr. Octopus's body. And I think, well, now they've really gone crazy. <laughs> I'm sure those are good stories, but I don't have any idea what it's all about. Yes, sir. In the um, next Iron Man movie... You think they're going to show Tony Stark having a drinking problem? In the next Iron Man movie, do you think they'll ever bring up Tony Stark's drinking problem, the alcoholism? Haven't they mentioned it or haven't they hinted at it yet? I thought they had. It may become an important part of, I don't know if it'll be the next movie, but I'm sure it'll become an important part of one of the movies. It's got to be. Yes. 
First of all, it's just an honor. Anything that begins with first of all, I want you to sit back and get comfortable. It'll take a while. Um, my question is, what gave you the idea for Iron Man? Well, I wanted to get a character. It was like a challenge. At the time Iron Man came out, all the young people were against war. They hated big businessmen, and they hated people who made munitions and, and armaments. And I figured, just for fun, I'm going to get a hero who makes munitions, who's very wealthy, <laughs> and, and see if it could work, you know? Luckily, it worked. And uh, he's one of my favorite characters, but I must tell you, the first issue that we did, I hated the way they drew his armor. And if you've been following the series, in almost every subsequent issue, his armor was different. I was never satisfied with the way it looked until finally, today, it's wonderful. But uh, that was the one strip I couldn't get the artist to get the armor right. But Hollywood did it right. So that's good. Nice. Thank you so, mu Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. Yes. Hi, Mr. Lee. Where did you meet your wife? Where and how did you meet your wife? Oh, gosh. You know, this is so much more fun than working. I wish I could just do this every day, all day long. Um, it was by accident. I had a blind date. I had just gotten out of the Army, and a friend arranged a blind date uh, for me with a model at a model agency, and that sounded pretty cool. No, in those days, they didn't have the word cool. It sounded pretty groovy. <laughs> that was a while ago. And I went up there, and I knocked on the door. And I have to preface this by telling you, when I was a kid, like most guys, I used to draw pretty girls. I used to draw my version of what the perfect girl would look like. And the, I rang the bell or something, and the door opened up, and this girl I had been drawing all my life was standing in front of me. And she wasn't the one I came to meet. She was the head model who opened the door. And, and she was English, and I love English people, and I love English accents, and I loved reading Shakespeare. And she said, may I help you? Much nicer than I just said it. And I'm looking at this dream that I've always drawn and she said, may I help you? And I think I mumbled something like, I love you. <laughs> so anyway, I took her to lunch. I never met the model I was supposed to meet, but I married Joni a few days later. I wasn't going to let her get away. <laughs> that was 66 years ago. 66 years ago. Congratulations. And she still looks great. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Mr. Stanley. This is Masai Irizari. Um, being in the Army for the last 10 years myself, I would really love to know what inspired you to create the character of Captain America, because I can relate to him very much. What inspired me what? What inspired you to create Captain America is the question. Oh, I, I hate that question because I have to admit, I didn't create Captain America. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby did. They created him before I even went to work for that company. But when I started working there, I started writing the characters. And then for some reason, after a while, after years, nobody was buying the Captain America book and we finally dropped it. Nobody was interested in a guy who just carried a shield and ran around fighting the bad guys. So we killed him by having him in an airplane that crashed somewhere near the North Pole, and he got stuck in a cake of ice, and that was the end of him. And years later, I realized he was a good-looking character. We ought to do something with him. So I wanted to bring him back. So I had some people discover the cake of ice, and they thawed it out. And since it was a comic book, he was still alive. <laughs> And what I wanted to do was try to give him some personality, so I tried to write him like a guy who, he was 40, 20, or 30, I don't know, years ahead of his time. He didn't understand hippies, and he didn't understand every, rock music and all the things that were going on. And um, I tried to imagine what would a guy be like who had been asleep in the ice all those years. And I tried to give him 
more character and personality, and he is a great-looking character. And that, sh oh, and the shield. Instead of just using it to stop bullets from hitting him, I wanted him to use it as a weapon where he could throw it like a boomerang, and it would come back to him, or he could do things with it. And he began to catch on. And would you believe he is now one of the most, maybe the most popular character in the Avengers? By the way, did you see the new Thor movie? Did you see did you see that one scene where somebody is carrying a Captain America shield? That got the biggest laugh, almost as big as my cameo. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Yes. Stan, on those characters that you did create, um, is what is the process that you kind of go through when developing new characters and, and what you're going to do with them? What is the process? What, what was the process when you were creating all these characters? What was the process of the creation? What did you go through? Well, I didn't go through much. I just sat down and said, what's this character like? Like with Spider-Man, I said, I want him to be a typical teenage kid, which means he'll have a lot of problems. The average typical teenage kid, every girl doesn't fall madly in love with him, and he never has enough money and stuff. I, I, these are fairy tale characters. They're ridiculous fantasy characters, but I tried to make them as believable as I could in their real lives. For example, you take Superman, and you don't have to take him. This is just an example. <laughs> but I never knew where Superman even lived. I didn't know where Clark Kent lived. I didn't know what problems he had. All I knew was he worried if he took off his glasses, people would think he was Superman. So I, I tried to give our characters a little more of a personal life what were they like and what did they want out of life and so forth. And it made it a little easier to write the stories if you get to know the characters. And none of them ever took their glasses off and were mistaken for somebody else. <laughs> you can say I'm a big Superman fan. Yes. So what is it like seeing the characters you wrote on the big screen? It's nice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's almost unbelievable. And the best thing about it, not only are, on, are they on the big screen, but they're done so well. I mean, they're making these magnificent movies, and I'm getting all the credit. And I don't have anything to do with the movies, but I'm happy to take the credit. I was um, wondering about your know, location, about your know, Fantastic Four, um, and uh, how you, you know, become Victor Von Doom. How did he come up with Victor Von Doom? Um, That's Dr. Doom, Victor Von Doom. Yeah. What did he say? How did, in the Fantastic Four, how did you come up with Victor Von Doom, Dr. Doom? I don't know. I... I was looking for a good villain for him, and I felt maybe a guy who r wants to rule the world and is the king of his own country would be a nice villain, especially if he could make robots and he had a great suit of armor. I love Dr. Doom. And um, the funny thing about it, and I'm going to tell you something you may never have thought about, because I, I don't like to feel that an audience leaves a panel with their stock of knowledge no greater than when they walked in. So here is something you're going to know that you didn't know before. Dr. Doom wants to rule the world. That is not a crime. You could walk up to a policeman in any city in America, and you could say, excuse me, officer, I'd like to rule the world. He can't arrest you. It's not a crime. So why is Dr. Doom considered a villain? All he wants to do is rule the world. Now think about that a little bit while I take a breath. <laughs> good evening, Stan. What was that? He said good evening. Oh, good evening. Is it night already? I'm going home. Well, <laughs> Man, that's just the closest thing I can think. <clears throat> okay, uh... You were very good friends with uh, Bob Kane, right? Yes. If he was still alive today, would you still rub it in his face with all your success? When I still would you still rub it in Bob's face about all your success? I never did. He rubbed it in my face all the time. 
Batman came out first and was a big hit. He never let me forget it. <laughs> now, he was a great guy, but he was a little different than I am. And so, and we go to a restaurant to have dinner. The minute the waiter walked over, and I would cringe, he would say, Hey, do you know who I am? I'm Bob Kane. I created Spider-Man. Wait a minute. I, I, I'm sorry. Batman. Wait a minute. I'll draw a picture of him for you. You know, and the waiter is standing there thinking, All I want is the guy's lunch order. Why doesn't he get off my back? But Bob loved being Bob Kane. He loved being known as the creator of Batman. And he was a very nice guy. It's just he lived what he did. I mean, he being the creator of Batman was the biggest thing in his life. And I guess I can see why. It was very successful and it made him a lot of money. How's that? But it Is that a nice, intelligent answer? The it, kind it you was. always ask me to give? Yes. You, All right. Was that a good answer? Yeah. See, I get graded on these things when I leave. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. Good morning, Mr. Lee. I was wondering, um, my brother and I have been big fans of Marvel for many years, and we both are card-carrying members of the fan. Members uh, of what? The fan club. Oh, the fan club, yeah. Were you uh, members of the MMMS? Uh, no. The fan. Merry Marvel Marching Society <laughs> from years ago. But that's okay. You can still be a fan. Sorry. right. <laughs> No, and your question? We were fans of old Marvel, but... Uh, Why are you looking that way? It's, it yes, sounds right to there. me like it's coming from there. It's because you have a speaker right there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, my, my question is about uh, African-American uh, superheroes. Did you have plans for many more and just it, weren't able to write them, or were the ones that you put out the only ones that you were thinking of creating? I need your help. When it comes to African-American superheroes... Uh, there, there are some out there. Did you ever have plans to create more? Actually, I created one, the Black Panther, and I loved him, and we're going to make a movie of him. And Don't tell anyone that. But, um, no, I ne it never occurred to me to make more because we didn't do that much with the Panther. I was always annoyed that my publisher didn't ask me to do more Black Panther stories. If he had, I would have suggested other ones. But now, we, since this is one world, I'm, I have a company called POW Entertainment, which is my little company away from Marvel and Disney. And we're doing a movie now about a Chinese, super, an American Chinese superhero named the Annihilator. And we're doing another one with an Indian, uh, in the nation of India, an Indian superhero named Chakra. And we're bringing back the Black Panther as a movie. And if these things all do well, oh, and I'm, I'm working on a Latino superhero, I feel, I feel we should have superheroes representing every race, every nationality, everything. And, and that's what we're working on, and I hope that the Black Panther movie is going to be as great as I hope it'll be, but I'll make sure it will be. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Stan. How do you feel about the legacy that, that you leave, you know, being that, you know, since you've been in the 60s, you know, all the generations that have come since then, you've touched directly or indirectly from the characters that you've created? I feel good. <laughs> no, it's, um, I'm not aware of it. I don't think about it until I come to a, a convention like this one and people mention it. And it's really a great feeling to see people of every age and they all seem to know me. And I never would have thought this would ever happen years ago. I don't know how to describe it, but it's the reason I love to do these panels and I love to come to conventions and meet the fans because mainly because it's hard for me to believe this is all happening, and I love every minute of it. Thank you, Stan. First of all, thank you for all you do. Uh, second, how do you work with the cameos now? Do they write something for you, or do you get to pick, or how does that work? How, do I, what? how does doing the cameos work? Do you get to pick it, write it, anything? No, I have absolutely nothing to do with them. The uh, director will call me, Hey, Stan, we're shooting your cameo. Be here at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, or whatever it is. 
I come on the set, they tell me what to do, then they get rid of me before I'll interfere with the screening. And I, it's the only thing I get out of it, really, sometimes I steal a piece of equipment, like in the, um, the scene in Thor where I drive the truck and I, I can't move the hammer. I was a truck driver, so they gave me a cap. They figured truck drivers wear caps. Now, this is just between us. I don't want the movie company to find out. I went home with that cap. I still have the cap. But I, I have nothing to say about... Oh, no, sometimes they'll tell me what to do, and I'll make a suggestion. I may suggest we change a word or two. In the Thor movie, if you saw it, I, say, I think I say, could I have my shoe back? It's funny because they gave me about three different things to say. One of them was something like, gee, I, I heard what you said, and that was very interesting, but can I have my shoe back? I thought they should have used that because that would have not only made it a cameo, but I would have been a supporting player. <laughs> but he cut it down to a few words so they wouldn't have to pay me as much. That's these guys with their budgets. They spend $100 trillion on special effects and cut four words out of my speech. <laughs> Next question. Hi, Stan. I'm Bart. Fantastic Four, number one, changed comics. It broke all the rules. My question is, did you have any job pressure before writing that comic? Did I have any what before writing it? Pressure, job pressure before writing. Fantastic well, what happened Four. with the Fantastic Four, my publisher was a nice enough guy, but he wasn't a big brain. <laughs> and he had me writing comic books for years where he said... I don't want too much dialogue. Don't worry about plots. Don't worry about characterization. Just give me a lot of action. That's what the readers want. I want a lot of action on every page. And I was doing it because it was a job. And after a while, I was really fed up. And I told my wife that I wanted to quit. And being practical and smarter than me, she said, well, before you quit, why don't you do one book the way you'd really like to do it? He'll probably fire you for it, but you want to quit anyway. At least you'll have gotten it out of your system. So that's when I did the Fantastic Four. And what was the question? I forgot the question. You're, you're, you're answering it. Oh, yeah. And, and um, <laughs> I decided to try to make them real people who had a relationship with each other. And instead of the young one just being the uh, teenage sidekick, I thought I'd make him one of the heroes, the, the Human Torch. And I'd make him the brother of the Invisible Girl. And I'd make the leader, Mr. Fantastic, engaged to her. And I'd make the other guy, the Thing, a good friend who's angry that he turned into the Thing. And I tried to make them real people as much as I could, which is exactly what my publisher never wanted me to concentrate on. And I had to put a lot of dialogue in to show how they talked to each other and acted toward each other. And I enjoyed doing it. And I was so happy that the book sold, and my publisher didn't say anything. He let me do others, and he let me write the others like that. And lo, a legend was born. Thanks, Dan. 